Well, this evening, since this morning, we, um, we were looking at the account that's sandwiched in between these two paragraphs dealing with Jairus. I'll just go ahead and read uh, the, um, the first uh, three verses, I guess, 40 through 42, and then skip ahead to verse 49 and read the, uh, the rest of the account. So Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 40. And as Jesus returned from the Gerasenes, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' uh, feet and began to implore him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. Uh, but as he went, the crowds were pressing against him. And then, of course, we have the account of the, uh, the woman with the hemorrhage and Jesus, uh, is Jesus' words to her, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And then verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mother. Now, they were all weeping and lamenting for her. But he said, stop weeping, for she has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. He, however, took her by the hand and, and called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up immediately and he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Well, may the Lord um, again bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, by way of review this morning, we, we saw Jesus return to Capernaum, where he was greeted by the crowd, and Jairus, as we've just read, who begged that he come uh, to heal his 12-year-old daughter. Uh, while they were going, the, the woman in the crowd, remember, reached out and touched the edge of his robe, believing that if she did, she would be healed, and as she believed, so she received. And again, we saw this this morning as an example of the kind of faith that we need to have to receive the Lord's blessing. If we would receive, we do need to come to Jesus. You know, often we don't have because we don't ask. So we need to remember to come to the Lord. We need to remember come to Him first of all and not last of all, not when we've come to the end of our resources, but at the beginning when the need presents itself. We need to come confidently. You know, it is true that um, when, you cons when we consider ourselves that we have forfeited God's blessings really over and over again through all of the sins we've committed. But we do need to remember, as the Lord's table reminds us from Lord's Day to Lord's Day, that the Father sent His Son Jesus into the world to take away our sins so that we can come, we can come confidently, we can come boldly. And the Lord wants us to come in that way. But we need to come believing. We need to believe that He will give us what we ask. If we doubt, James tells us, we won't receive anything. But if we have faith, we can receive all things. But sometimes, you know, what we need is beyond really the faith that we have to receive. Sometimes the things we need, we just don't believe are possible. Now, we need to understand this evening that Jesus will help us in, in this area as well. Uh, Luke now uh, shows us this as he picks up the story that he laid aside for the moment uh, the healing of Jairus' daughter, and this evening what I want us to consider are basically two things. Uh, how Jesus tests Jairus' faith. And then secondly, how the Lord will also test our faith so that we might grow stronger and receive the blessing. Now, first of all, let's look at how Jesus tests Jairus' faith. Now, Luke tells us, first of all, that Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue that was at Capernaum. And um, uh, we, we needed maybe a little bit of background as far as what a synagogue would be helpful uh, because um, we, we do need to understand that they were established for the worship 
of, of the Lord. And this is how worship was taking place during Jesus' time. It really began, synagogue worship really began around the time of the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. Remember, the northern kingdom was taken by Assyria first and then the southern kingdom by Babylon later. The Jews were uprooted from their lands and, and some, the southern kingdom, was taken mainly to Babylon. But the Assyrian kingdom took the Jews in the north and basically dispersed them throughout the world. Uh, that's what we call the diaspora or the uh, dispersion. Now, since it was no longer possible for the Jews uh, who were dispersed to worship in the temple at Jerusalem, they established synagogues where devout Jews would gather together, particularly on the Sabbath and on the Jewish feast days, uh, to basically uh, learn from the, those pious and learned Jews as they read and explained or expounded God's word. Uh, they would go there to learn, but they would also go there to worship. As a matter of fact, synagogue worship is much like the worship that we have today. Now, prior to the synagogue, as we know, worship was held at the temple, but that was only from time to time. It was really held primarily within households on the Sabbath. The households would meet together, they would rest, and they would worship the Lord, and then their families would make the trek to the temple um, three times a year for the males, but at other times as well as the law required. Now, after the return from the exile, synagogue worship continued providing convenient places for Jesus and for his apostles to evangelize. They would go to the synagogues on the Sabbath where Jesus would read the scriptures and explain them and explain that he's the fulfillment of them. And even after Jesus died and rose again from the dead and sent his apostles out, they would go, first of all, to the synagogues on the Sabbath to minister Jesus. These synagogues, as I mentioned before, the worship that was going on in them eventually provided the form of New Testament worship. It was based on synagogue worship. This worship was maintained, uh, basically financed by God's people. It was governed by elders. There were a multiplicity of elders, one or more of which were called the rulers of the synagogue who would plan and conduct worship. Well, Mark tells us that Jairus, actually Luke tells us that Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. Mark tells us that he was one of the rulers of the synagogue, which was at Capernaum. And that's one of the things that makes it somewhat surprising, that Jairus would come out and seek Jesus' help, since basically the leaders of the synagogue, the rulers of the synagogue, the scribes and the Pharisees, and the leaders of the Jews typically were not sympathetic to Jesus. Now, like the woman we saw this morning, here was someone else who had come to the end of his resources, of everything he could do. And he had to look outside of the ordinary means for help. Luke tells us that Jairus had a daughter, and she was his only daughter. I think we could perhaps understand this to mean that she was his only child, and she was only 12 years old, and she was dying. Now, I think, you know, those of us who have children, we understand how precious children are to us, you know, how they will always be precious to us, but I think they're so much more precious while they're still young and they depend on us to care for them and to protect them. I think we should assume that Jairus had exhausted all the customary remedies to try to help his daughter, which again in those days were, were not very many. And he too had heard about Jesus and realized that Jesus was his only hope. Now, it is possible that the urgency of his situation pushed him through any biases he might have had regarding Jesus and brought him humbled to his feet, or he may have been one of those rare individuals, and I think perhaps he was, who actually believed that Jesus was the Messiah. One thing we should notice about this situation is that the Lord often uses difficulties just like this to drive us to his feet, to compel us to come to him, not only for salvation, but for the things that we desperately need. Now, sadly, we don't often come to the Lord as we should when things are going well. You remember how the, uh, uh, in, in the Proverbs, how uh, I think it's Agur is, is basically praying this prayer, Lord, don't, don't give me so little that I'll be tempted to steal, but don't give me so much that I'll be tempted to say, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? 
Uh, oftentimes that happens. Prosperity turns us away from the Lord. And when things are going well, the Lord sometimes wakes us up by bringing difficult circumstances so that we will seek him again, so that we will come back to him. Well, Jairus has come and he, he implores Jesus. He humbles himself at his feet, asks Jesus to come, and Jesus goes. Jesus had just started to go with Jairus when he encountered, of course, the woman. But while Jesus was finishing speaking with her, someone came from Jairus' house with the news that his daughter had died. He shouldn't really trouble Jesus any longer. Now, again, you know, put yourself in Jairus' situation. We can only, you know, I think we can imagine how Jairus felt and how his heart sank when he heard these words because what he was fearing the most had actually taken place. His, his only daughter, his only child had died. All of his hope for her recovery and for her having a long and a full life were shattered. And the only thing that he had really to look forward to from that point was simply long days of grief and suffering and mourning for this child. Now, I think we should assume from Jairus' reaction that he really didn't yet understand what Jesus was really capable of doing. I don't think Jairus knew what Jesus had done for the widow of Nain, that he had raised her son from the dead. Um, you know, he was thinking that, that his daughter was dead and, and that was it, that he wouldn't see her again. At least he wouldn't see her in this life. But again, here we see our Lord's compassion. When Jesus heard what the messenger had to say, and he knew the impact that it was going to have upon Jairus, he said to him in verse 50, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. Jesus was asking Jairus to trust him, to trust him even when it appeared that all hope was gone. Now, we're not told, but I think we should assume that Jairus did believe. I think he believed at least some degree by God's grace because he didn't just give up and tell Jesus to go on his business, but they continued toward Jairus' house. He seemed to have some hope because of what Jesus said, that she might yet be saved even though she had died. Now, when they came to the house, Jesus didn't allow anyone to enter into the house except his closest circle. Peter, James, and, and John. You know, it's interesting. These same three are, are the ones that he will take with him to the Mount of Transfiguration, which we're going to see in the next chapter, and to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays and asks the Lord for the grace to be able to endure what it is he's about to endure. We know that Jesus loved all of his disciples. Jesus loves everyone that belongs to him. He loves all of his brethren in the Lord. But we do need to recognize also that Jesus had his favorites, and apparently these were his, his closest and most trusted disciples. So he brought them in to see what it is he was going to do uh, with this girl. And he also brought in the girl's father and mother. Now when they entered, Jesus found uh, Jairus' relatives and friends, the servants, and the mourners are basically the hired mourners. They, they were all weeping for her. They were all lamenting for her. And we know some of this was genuine and some of it wasn't genuine. But Jesus wanted this to stop because of what he was about to do. So he tells him in verse 52, stop weeping. For she has not died, but is asleep. I think the idea of being asleep here tells us something about the state of this, of this girl. But of course, believing that, um, that Jesus was crazy, believing that they knew better than Jesus the exact state of this, of this child, they began to laugh and ridicule him. Now, it's not mentioned here as it is in Mark's gospel, but it's certainly implied that Jesus then put them all out. Uh, he didn't want them to see what was about to take place. He didn't want to. I think we have an example here of, of not wanting to cast his pearl before swine. You know, Jesus didn't really do miracles for those who didn't believe in him. He wasn't, you know, trying to prove to them that he was the Messiah. He basically did miracles for those who would believe in order to confirm their faith and to confirm to them exactly uh, 
who he was. Uh, when, again, those who were hostile towards him were around, uh, Jesus did very little because of the lack of faith. So after putting them out, he then takes the child by the hand and says, child arise, and her spirit returned, and she got up immediately, and he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. Now, God tells us in his word that we have a spirit, don't we? As long as that spirit is united with our bodies, we are alive. But once that union has been severed, we die. But that spirit still exists, doesn't it? The spirit was somewhere during the time of this child's death. Now, where was her spirit? You know, we don't know for sure. It's certainly possible that her soul could have entered into heaven when the Bible talks about the death of believers. It says, you know, we haven't really died, but we're sleeping. And the reason is because it's a sleep that doesn't go on forever. Eventually, the Lord is going to awaken us from our sleep, as Jesus did with this girl. Or it could have been held by the Father. The Bible says that when we die, our spirit returns to the, the Father of spirits. And then, of course, he will do with it according to his will. But since it was the Lord's intention to raise her again to life, perhaps she didn't enter into heaven but was held somewhere uh, waiting for that moment because it was really only moments between the time that she died and Jesus ro uh, raised her again from the dead. I don't, we also don't see anything in this text about an experience that this girl has, like that of the Apostle Paul. Remember how Paul was stoned to death on one occasion? And I think he describes what he actually experienced and what he saw when he was raised to the third heaven. You know, basically the heaven where God dwells and saw things that really couldn't be expressed in words. We believe that event was tied to the time that, that he died. We don't know exactly what happened to this uh, young girl's soul. But we do know that at Jesus' command, her soul returned to her body and she began to live again. Jesus uh, told Martha, remember, and at the resurrection of Lazarus just before he raised him from the dead in John 11, verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus is telling us here that if we are trusting Jesus, that even though we will one day die, we will physically die, our souls will continue to live with him forever. They are immortal. And, and I mean, they're immortal whether we're saved or not saved. But if, if we're going to be with the Lord in heaven, we have to trust in Jesus. But he will keep us and we will go to be with him. And then when Jesus comes the second time, he is going to bring our souls with him and reunite them with our bodies. And our bodies will live again, just as Jairus' daughter began to live again. And then after her soul returned, she immediately got up. Jesus told them to give her something to eat. And I think this was to prove to them that, that she was alive. I mean, was this just her imagination? Or has she really been raised from the dead? Jesus, when he appears to his disciples later after his resurrection in Luke chapter 24, verses 41 through 43, as they're looking at him in amazement that he could possibly be there, Jesus said, give me something to eat. It was proof to them that he had been raised from the dead. And I think he was wanting to confirm to the parents that their daughter was, in fact, alive. And when her parents saw this, they were amazed. This is beyond, as it were, what they were expecting. The word amazed there essentially means they were so astonished as to be completely overwhelmed. And I think they were overwhelmed not only with the amazement that she was alive again, but they were overwhelmed with joy. Jesus had turned their mourning into dancing, as the Lord is often given to do. Now, finally, he told them, since they were his only, basically the only witnesses outside of Peter, James, and John, and again, the, the implication that he had put everybody else out of the house, he told them not to tell anyone what, what he had done for this young lady. Uh, Jesus does this at other times, remember? He, um, and I think it's likely because Jesus didn't want things uh, to continue to move towards uh, basically his crucifixion too quickly. Uh, 
uh, as Jesus becomes more and more public, as his miracles become more and more public, the opposition to him becomes greater and it leads eventually to the cross. So Jesus wanted to keep this a bit more quiet until he finished his ministry uh, in Palestine. Now, as I've said, this was essentially a test for Jairus in, in different ways. It was a test of just how much Jairus would actually believe. Jesus wanted him to trust him, even though it appeared that all hope was gone. I mean, not only was the girl dying, that was perhaps test enough for most of us, but the Lord actually allowed this child to die. All hope was essentially gone. And one thing we need to recognize in the scripture is that the Lord often does remove all of our earthly hope before he breaks through with blessing. And this is something we see happening over and over and over again in scripture. It's not something unusual. Remember what happened to Job. Job had everything taken away from him. His children were all killed. All of his possessions, all of his wealth was taken away by foreign powers. His, his health, he lost that as well as the Lord allowed him to be struck. Even the comfort of his wife and his friends was removed from him, and yet Job trusted, and the Lord restored everything to him and even more. And his later days were more prosperous than his earlier days. Uh, God had made to Abraham a promise that he would be the father of many nations, but Abraham had to wait until all earthly hope was gone of the fulfillment of that promise. He was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And then after Isaac was born, God, you know, and realizing that he was the child of promise and the one that through whom all the nations would essentially be eventually blessed with the coming of the Messiah, God called Abraham to take that child of promise and to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. And I think by that time, Isaac was not necessarily a young lad, but we do know that he hadn't been married and he had no children. And yet, he was willing, Abraham was willing to take him to do this, basically crucifying or putting to death everything that God had promised to him. But because he was willing to do this when it looked like the promise was about to die with Isaac, the Lord spared Isaac and he blessed Abraham with many more children. And he became the father of many nations. The disciples, when Jesus was ministering during the, the, year, uh, the years of his popularity, remember the disciples believed that the hope that Jesus had brought was that he was going to deliver Israel from basically the, uh, the dominion of Rome, that he was a political Messiah. But that hope was taken away from them when Jesus was crucified on the cross. Remember the conversation Jesus had with the two on the road to Emmaus. We were hoping that it was he who would redeem Israel. As a matter of fact, he was redeeming Israel, but he was doing it differently than what they thought. They thought their hopes were gone until the Lord was raised again to life from the dead. Remember when um, Paul was on his way to Rome and um, the, you know, there was the storm and it was breaking up the ship and the Lord told him he needed to stay on the ship and everybody needed to stay on the ship if anybody was going to be saved. But it seemed like staying on the ship was going to be the, the, the quickest road to death. But it was because they stayed on the ship that the Lord spared all of them. When it seemed like all hope was gone, the Lord brought deliverance. Well, you see the same thing is true here, isn't it, with regard to Jairus. He thought that his hopes for his daughter's future and the future of his family were all gone when she died. Uh, but Jesus raised her again to life. Now, the Lord, we need to remember, um, works often in this way. Uh, he makes his providences, I think it's one of the Puritans who wrote this at one time, but he makes his providences to go contrary to his promises. And what that means is that he makes the situation seem like it's going the wrong way before he brings the, the blessing to us to see if we're still going to believe him, to see if we're still going to hold on to his promises even when it seems like things are becoming hopeless. And the reason why the Lord does this is to make our faith grow stronger. The reason he does this is because he's working through these things in order to strengthen us. Remember, Jairus did not have that strength in and of himself. 
to believe even to the degree that he did, nor did any of these others by themselves. It was the grace of God working in them. It was like Jesus encouraging uh, Jairus, don't be afraid any longer, but believe, and your daughter will be made well. I think of that, um, that illustration of this very thing in Pilgrim's Progress, which you know, is really a picture book of just about everything we have to go through as, as Christians. When Christian is in Mr. Interpreter's house, I think one of my favorite illustrations uh, in, in the house is where he goes into the room and he sees this fire that's burning in, next to a wall and there's a man who's pouring water on the fire, trying to put it out. But the more water he pours on it, the, the brighter the fire actually burns. And, and while Christian is trying to figure out how can that be, interpreter takes him to behind the wall where there's a man who's secretly feeding oil into the fire to keep it burning. And basically this is a picture of the very thing we're looking at. Satan is going to try to put out the fire. He's going to try to quench our hopes and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his promises. But the Lord is secretly feeding uh, his spirit uh, there to keep us going, to keep us believing, to strengthen us. The fire doesn't get lower, the fire burns brighter. It doesn't it seem like the things in the kingdom of, of heaven go contrary to the way you would think things would work out. By trying to quench the fire, it burns more brightly instead of just simply stoking it with, with more fuel, which is kind of the way we wish it would, it would work. But the Lord knows best. And adversity is what he uses to strengthen our faith. What William Cooper wrote in his hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, actually says this quite well. He says, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. We do need to understand when the Lord brings these difficulties and trials in our lives, He intends these things to end in blessing. He intends to give us what it is He's promised, and He intends along the way to strengthen our faith that He will do exactly as He has promised. But the one thing we need to do is we need to trust Him because He is faithful. If we don't feel like we can right now, we need to call out to the Lord for His mercy. We need to look back at his faithfulness through the years, and we need to understand that Jesus is with us just as much by his Holy Spirit as he was with Jairus encouraging us that we don't need to be afraid. We only need to trust, and we will see what it is that we have been seeking the Lord for. So I hope that this is an encouragement to us in the difficulties that we're going through. certainly is an encouragement to me that the Lord will do what He says. We just need to get our eyes off of the wind and the waves, right? And get them fixed upon Jesus and keep them fastened there, Jesus and His Word and His promises. Well, may the Lord give us uh, the grace to do that. Let, let's just take a moment and, and pray and ask the Lord to help us.